Welcome back to chapter 23 in module 5. In this video we are going to talk about what happens to high mass stars when they have run out of fusion options. So before a high mass star dies, its core has gone through many different stages of fusion, starting with hydrogen to helium fusion. We called that the CNO cycle a couple of videos ago. Then it's able to do helium to carbon fusion. We talked about the triple alpha process a few videos ago. And there's a whole bunch more phases that we're not going to name or discuss, but it is extremely important that we understand that iron is the final stage of this process. It's the very last energy source that stars have available through fusion if they're trying to make small things into big things and receive energy out of that process. We mentioned this binding energy curve a few, um, a few videos back as well. Now, it is worth noting that each time a star goes through a new stage of fusion, it's about a tenth the time available to it as a fusion source. So hydrogen to helium fusion is like 90% of a star's lifetime, then helium to carbon fusion is about 9%, and so on. In fact, it gets so extreme that the last stage of fusion, turning silicon into iron, lasts about a day. And things don't normally last like human short time scales in astronomy, Often when we say that a star lives for a short period of time, we're talking about hundreds of thousands of years. But something happening for only a day is a big deal. These stars are getting very desperate to power themselves against this very strong pull of gravity. And once they make iron, they've run out of options. The inert iron core at that point then, is so dense that it collapses beyond electron degeneracy pressure. It will not stop and make a white dwarf at any point during this process. White dwarfs are only associated with low mass stars. So instead, that core goes past the electron degener degeneracy pressure. It pushes all of the electrons into the nuclei of their atoms, converting this huge amount of protons into neutrons, releasing a huge number of neutrinos and creating this huge shock wave back through the star. This bounce back creates an enormous shock wave that explodes the star entirely. This is called a type two supernova. We mentioned at the end of the last video that a type 1 supernova is a white dwarf that goes past the Chandrasekhar limit, and so it explodes. The white dwarf is completely obliterated in that process. A type 2 supernova is just the outer layers of a high-mass star. There is still going to be that extremely, extremely dense core, and we will talk about the two possible things that are left behind after we talk about a type 2 supernova. Now. Probably the most famous modern example of a type 2 supernova is supernova 1987A. It was discovered in 1987, and it was the first one. Sometimes we're not great at naming things. But what's interesting is it was the very first supernova for hundreds of years, since 1604, that was visible with just the human eye and not a telescope or binoculars um, required. It did not happen in our own galaxy, but in a neighboring galaxy called the Large Magellanic Cloud. We will be talking eventually about our local group of galaxies. The Large Magellanic Cloud is a um, much, much smaller galaxy that is next to, but outside of, the Milky Way. We were actually able to measure neutrinos from that explosion. I mentioned the, on the previous slide that as the core collapses, Electrons and protons get turned into neutrons, and neutrinos are a byproduct of that. Supernova 1987A was close enough and was um, identified quickly enough that the neutrino telescopes that we mentioned very briefly that study the sun, those same kind of neutrino telescopes were also able to detect neutrinos 
and have enough confidence to connect them to that particular explosion. Supernova remnants all through the sky, they show an aftermath of a very powerful and high energy explosion. Um, there's a video linked here that I'm not going to put into the YouTube playlist um, that's called Supernova Sonata. Kind of gives us a sense of the occurrence rate of different um, supernova and is really a cool um, and creative video. This image though, what we're looking at here is on the left, the overall view of a supernova remnant when we add X-ray imagery with visible imagery with infrared and color code them to give us a sense of what's going on. Our eyes would not be able to see most of these wavelengths, but this overall view gives us a sense that what we're seeing is an explosion that just continues to move outwards. And that's true for many different supernova that we can track from one decade to the next. We can see actual changes in their structure. The next slide is going to show us several different examples of type 2 supernova happening in extremely dense, distant galaxies. These galaxies are studied with the Hubble Space Telescope and they're so far away from us that even at the best resolution that Hubble has, they just kind of look like blobs. But the arrow at the top of each one of these is showing a supernova explosion and the bottom is showing that same exact patch of sky when the supernova is not happening, either before or after the explosion. And we can see that these type 2 supernova can be so powerful that they can outshine the entire host galaxy for a couple of hours or days. These are extremely, extremely powerful events. So low mass stars just gently throw off their outer layers as a planetary nebula and high mass stars end their lives in a huge explosion called a type two supernova. To then compare what's left behind, in the center of planetary nebula, there are often visible white dwarfs that are sitting there, the exposed core of that low mass star. When we look at most supernova remnants though, we don't see anything left behind. So what happened to the core of high mass stars after a type two supernova. Until the 1960s, astronomers didn't really know what happened. They knew that they exploded, but they didn't have a way to determine what would be left behind. It took until Jocelyn Bell Burnell, as a graduate student, discovered the first pulsar. There's a lighthouse at the top of this um, slide here because there's a lighthouse model for what a pulsar is. A pulsar is just a special type of neutron star that has beams of radiation that actually just swing around the way that lighthouse lights do. So if you are a distant ship in the middle of Lake Michigan and you see a lighthouse, you might see just flashes of light, very regular flashes, and what you're seeing is when the beam sweeps past you, you see the light, and when it's not sweeping past you, you don't. That's why a pulsar gets its name, that it pulses. It's not actually flashing. It is a constant beam that is rotating. Not all neutron stars have this beam of radiation, but it was our way to be able to have a measurable and observable example of what's called a neutron star. It took several different studies to be able to fully connect these pulsars with supernova, but the Crab Nebula was really the key to all of this. The Crab Nebula is the remnant of a supernova that was observed in 1054 Common Era. Cultures from around the world made notes in their astronomical observations of this bright extra star in the sky that disappeared after a couple of days or weeks. The Crab Nebula is the source of that bright new star, and it was a supernova that was visible to the human eye. When we look at the Crab Nebula in x-rays, on the far left image it's color-coded in purple, 
in the middle image, we're just showing the x-rays. We can actually see the beams of radiation when we use that x-ray imagery. And so a reminder here um, for the lighthouse model. The Crab Nebula was our way to kind of confirm the hypothesis or provide evidence towards the hypothesis that this was a um, remnant of a high mass star. It was at the center of this explosion that we knew was a type 2 supernova. And so now we have a neutron star at the center here. So when that massive star explodes as a type 2 supernova, it converts its entire core into neutrons. We had in the previous video a small analogy for white dwarfs. If we imagined a room full of balloons, we could gather all of the balloons and have what is basically a white dwarf held up by electron degeneracy pressure, where the balloon's surface was like the electron clouds. But a neutron star has gone further than that. Imagine that we put a little um, grain of sand in each one of those balloons. When we press too hard in the process of making a possible white dwarf. We go past that point, we never make a white dwarf, and instead we get rid of the balloons, we pop them all, and now we just have a small handful of grains of sand. We've gotten rid of all of the empty space that an atom has. Although we didn't focus very hard on it in chapter 5, it is worth understanding that an atom is mostly empty space. When we take out all of that extra space, basically, that extra volume, a neutron star is beyond comprehension how dense it really is. There is nothing on Earth that gets even remotely close to the density, nothing in our solar system that gets close to the density of a neutron star. A neutron star is basically a whole bunch of neutrons that are physically packed together as much as they will go. If, if grains of sand are hard to picture, think about having a whole bunch of marbles in your hand. Those marbles physically cannot be pressed closer together. That's what we mean by neutron degeneracy pressure. We call this stellar remnant a neutron star because it's a whole bunch of neutrons but it isn't really a star, and so that's something worth making sure we understand. A neutron star is what's called a stellar remnant. It's the dead remains of what used to be a star. It is not doing anything active anymore. And it is so small that it does not um, get put on our Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. It is not glowing in a way that we can kind of compare it to white dwarfs at all. And in fact, a neutron star is about the size of a city. It has more mass than the sun and is about the size of a city. This image here compares a neutron star illustration to the city of Boston. You can click the link in the slides that are posted um, to see a neutron star over Chicago. And the density is just incomprehensible. If we took a little tiny teaspoon of neutron star and tried to compare it to what Earth's gravity would do to it, it would weigh a hundred million tons. There is nothing that we can compare it to that makes any sense to our brains. We just need to acknowledge that if we took more than the sun's mass and crunched it down to be about 10 kilometers across, we would be getting densities that are off the charts. All right. Now... If a pulsar is in a binary system with a hidden companion, because pulsars are the observable um, type of neutron star, we can use the Doppler effect the same way that we did with spectroscopic binary stars back in module four to determine the mass of that second hidden object. It could be a regular neutron star, one that isn't creating beams of light, but there is a maximum mass to what can make a neutron star. So stars less than about 10 solar masses, they aren't going to do type 2 supernova. They aren't going to leave behind a neutron star. Those low mass stars make a white dwarf. Stars between roughly 10 and 40 solar masses, though, 
the mass left over in their core is between about 1.4 solar masses, the lowest neutron star, because that's right around the Chandrasekhar limit, and about the upper limit of three solar masses. Because if you have more than three solar masses in your neutron star, gravity will crunch those marbles into each other. And what we think of as something that is impossible to do becomes, well, still kind of impossible. Gravity kind of breaks physics in a small area. If there is so much gravity in the core, there's nothing that can fight back against gravity. And gra gravity effectively wins. It punches a hole through the fabric of space-time and creates a singularity. And all of these cool ideas we have about black holes are going to be the topic of our next video when we talk about that highest mass stellar remnant. I will see you in that next video.